I'd like to say good morning to all of my friends and also to my many enemies. Once again, this is another episode of Roosevelt Sounds Off. And on this morning, which is January 15th of 2018, I'm doing this special video, a small tribute to the one who this day is named after. Yes, that is the late, great Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King, who was born in Atlanta, Georgia in the 1920s, and he grew up the son of a Baptist preacher known as Daddy King. He was known as Daddy King, but then later on, um, his father um, had read certain things on the life of the great, you know, minister, uh, minister and great reformer, religious reformer known as Martin Luther, who's also the founder of the Lutheran Church. And so he went and changed the names of his he and his son to Martin Luther. And they were known from that point as Martin Luther King Sr. as Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. grew up and was educated, received a bachelor's, master's, and eventually a doctorate. And then, you know, became the pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church that's in Georgia. And then he was a great civil rights icon, faced a whole lot of things, and faced a whole lot of arrest, and helped to sign the Civil Rights Act. And he faced a whole lot of things just to fight for black people in this country in order to have rights. And one of his main points of his life was that he gave the I Have a Dream speech in the summer of 1963. And um, he was um, basically talking about that he had a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the four of sons of former slave owners can unite and join hands and be united under the same banner of brotherhood. He said he had a dream that his four children, that they would be judged by the content of their character rather than by the, con the color of their skin. He had a dream. And it was a great speech, but later on in his life, shortly before he was assassinated and this is me, what many people don't know about Martin Luther King is that he later on said that he believed that this dream had begun to escape him because he just believed that with all of the stuff that he was doing for civil rights and for blacks to have rights in this country that we're still very very far ahead so I'm pretty sure he began to get discouraged I mean because I'm pretty sure it is discouraging whenever you you know are trying to make a change whenever and, and you don't see change coming swiftly enough and so after a while you know even though he fought for integration for blacks to have the same jobs and eat in the same kind of lunch counters and do some of the same things that whites did. After a while, he began to say that I am, I think that I am integrating my people into a burning house. Because even though he had a dream, and we know that Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4th of 1968, and even the day before he was assassinated, he gave a great speech where he says that God allowed him to come up to the mountain and allowed him to look over into the promised land and he said that I might not get there with you but one of these days we as a people will get to the promised land mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord and that was the day before he was assassinated um and so I wanted to give like my little tribute, my two cents in on this day of um, the Martin Luther King holiday. And I understand that he had a dream and that he and other civil rights leaders, whether they be Malcolm X, whether they be Medgar Evers and, you know, others have fought so blacks could have the same rights as others. It still let us know um, when he said that he feels like he's integrating his people into a burning house and even he began to get discouraged sometimes on his own dream it still let us know that we as a people even though some of these other people and civil rights icons are gone on to glory it still let us know as a people that we still have work to do we still have work to do <clears throat> even 
not only when it comes down to prejudice and racism with whites against blacks, we have work to do within our own community with relating to each other because if we have not treated each other well, if we have not, you know, gained acceptance among each other, then we can't be accepted by anybody until we are first accepted amongst ourselves. We cannot think about uniting with anybody else until we first unite it with ourselves. So the group of people in which we belong to, that's the one that we should be the most concerned with, which is mostly our people. We still have issues in the black community of violence, of miseducation, of police brutality, of gang violence against each other. And we even still have the issue of colorism. I mean, if a whole lot of you all who've been following me for a number of years, um, I did a video on colorism, which means light skinned against dark skin blacks, you know, a few years ago here on my YouTube channel. And I talked about, if some people remember the video, how colorism even goes on even within my own family. It's a certain side of the family that favors people you know, who are lighter skin all over people who are darker. I mean, I got two cousins and they're both brother and sister. And even though my, uh, the female cousin is not exactly what we would call high yellow, you know, she's like a brown skin. But my other cousin, you know, who's her brother is darker. He's treated differently by that side of the family all because he's younger. It goes on in my, it's sad that it goes on in my own family in 2018. I mean, you would think that after people like Malcolm X have come to talk, teach us, after Martin Luther King, after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, after Medgar Evers, you would think that we would get better, but it seems like the state of the black community is in a state of emergency because we're only getting worse. I mean, last year, you all will not believe it. I had a young lady who told me that she refused to date me, even though I never did anything to this young lady, never hurt this young lady, and I don't think that this young lady can really, as far as my character goes, which is supposed to be judging, which according to is like how somebody would act or how somebody would treat you and the kind of lifestyle that they live, she can never really say anything bad necessarily about me or about my character. She said she wouldn't date me because she, refer, she prefers or has a preference for somebody who's lighter or more brown skin. So in other words, to her, I was too dark. This is sad, a state of affairs of what is, you know, in 2017, 2018, as to what is going on. You walk into the black community, the only thing that you see is corner stores, stores owned by Arabs. And what are they selling? All these cigarettes that are going to bring cancer and you know, disease into the black community. They're selling alcohol and they're even selling these um, blunts. These swishers that they call them with the young men, you know, take the stuff out and everything and load it up with something with weed. And anytime you walk into the black community, it's a sh low down, dirty, filthy shame. The only thing that you smell in a whole lot of neighborhoods is nothing but a combination of piss, cigarettes and weed and alcohol. This is what has come to define us for some reason. We need to get out of this kind of way of acting, out of this kind of way of thinking. These people like Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Medgar Evers died that we may do better. We need to drop all of these habits that the white man has put on us. Get rid of his alcohol, get rid of his cigarettes, get rid of his weed, get rid of his drugs. Drive it all out of the black community so we can be better. Stop taking the so-called white man's poisons into your body. You, some of you all talk about what the white man is doing all day long, but yet you're endorsing the white man because you're putting his poisons into your body every single day through his alcohol, through your drinking, through your smoking. So if you do that little bit first, then we could get somewhere. And then, you know, with the number of killings with African-American men and young boys, um, in, in the black community. I talked to my own godson about falling into the wrong crowd, which he's fallen into. I tell him about his drinking and his smoking. And, you know, he tells me, even though he's 16 years old, well, I can smoke. And this, you can't tell me nothing. This is my house. This is my house, and yet you're only 16. I can't believe he told me that one day. It's my house. 
you know, just, you know, I try to advise him. His mother tries to talk to him. Other people have tried to talk to him. Just hard-head. So Martin Luther King and some of these other people did not die so we could continue on in just failure and, you know, in just failure and just doing bad. We're supposed to come up. We're supposed to be doing a whole lot better. So that's my challenge to you on this Martin Luther King Day is just to do better. Stop these habits. Reach one, um, teach one, or each one teach one. You know, get these young men. Teach them the right way of how to go. Tell them even to get into a good, God-fearing, Bible-believing church where they can be taught the Word of God. Tell them not to fall into the habit of the drugs and the alcohol and falling into the prison system of the United States criminal um, prison industrial complex. So we can do better as a whole because I believe in Martin Luther King today was still alive. That's exactly what he would want. And that would be part of of us or a part of us fulfilling our part of his dream for black people to do better but it cannot start with white people giving us rights and allowing us to sit at a certain lunch counter or even allowing us to vote it must begin with our actions it means it must begin with us so that's where I'm gonna leave it anybody who liked this video be sure to like and subscribe I'll see everybody on the next video peace and blessings to all